11 Paralyzing Monsters from Extreme Ghostbusters Explained Misunderstood masterpiece that was way ahead of its time. If you may have been a fan of the Emmy-nominated The Real Ghostbusters, then there is a high chance that you may have not liked its follow-up series, Extreme Ghostbusters, as much as the original show. A part of the Ghostbusters franchise, this animated television series aired on TV during the fall of 1997, generating 40 episodes, each displaying disturbingly horrifying monsters that no one could have ever thought existed. Created by Dan Aykroyd and the late Harold Allen Ramis, and also based on Ivan Reitman's 1984 American supernatural comedy film, Ghostbusters, the series followed the quests of the next generation Ghostbusters, hunting and capturing spirits all over New York and at times beyond the city as well. The new team consisted of four college students, expert on the occult Kylie Griffin, sarcastic Latino shirker Eduardo Rivera, white paraplegic athlete Garrett Miller, and the erudite African-American machinery whiz Roland Jackson. The team was led by our very own Dr. Egon Spengler, and we also had secretary Janine Melnitz and the mascot Ghost Slimer from the original film filling the cast. You cannot deny the fact that Extreme Ghostbusters did devote a lot of time and energy to carving out its very own position in a franchise that, to be honest, was better known for its comical moments than its scary ones. Well, Extreme Ghostbusters was sensible enough to scoop up the shadier portions that the real Ghostbusters left hanging and ultimately put together a pretty developed analysis of the horrors of life, death, and beyond. The series did not divert from its original supernatural comic setting, but it did have a refurbished, darker feel, something that brought a lot of new fans to the franchise. This misunderstood masterpiece was way ahead of its time, and if you still have not seen it, do not let anything stop you from watching it now. So in today's video, we're going to talk about 11 paralyzing monsters from the Extreme Ghostbusters series in detail. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Brethren, let the procedure begin. Craniac from Deadliners. If you are someone who is of the opinion that cartoons cannot be terrifying, then we sincerely urge you to think again. If it works for you, we recommend you to watch the fifth episode of Extreme Ghostbusters titled Deadliners. Directed by Scott Wood and written by Duane Capizzi, the episode revolves around a group of demonic creatures that not only kidnap people, but also turn them into monsters. The extreme Ghostbusters start investigating the string of disappearances and soon learn that the creator of these creatures is the famous children's horror novelist J. N. Klein. So who exactly is Craniac? Well, he happens to be the leader of a trio of interdimensional corporeal entities. Craniac, along with his henchmen Corpusel and Gristle, through some form of telepathy, literally forged an alliance with Klein. The whole alliance was a stratagem to write them into existence as immortal beings, with Klein bound to his typewriter to do so. This resulted in the author writing a succession of well-received books based on these very entities. With Klein writing more and more novels, Craniac and his henchmen were free to go on with their ceremonial acts, transforming innocent people into monsters called Vathic. Craniac was more than often displayed as the main monster in Klein's novels, his character usually taking the role of an unhinged butcher, one who thought of his inhuman creations as a form of art. If you are still wondering what the fictitious character Craniac looks like, let us help you out here. He is the heavy, dreadful one who has a buzzsaw on his head. He is usually seen wearing long black gloves along with a brown apron. Next comes the highlight of his appearance, that tan mask which is kind of sewed, or let us assume it is at least attached to his face. The mask sort of extends his mouth open, leaving his teeth constantly on display. Lastly, he wears dark, huge shades that hook around his extremely tiny ears. Not many know this, but the character of the author Klein is actually based on the real-life author R. L. Stein, famous for his Goosebumps series of horror-themed novels for children. Also, the monsters on display are actually based on the villains of the Hellraiser franchise, mostly the Cenobites. Even the designs were done with Hellraiser in mind, and if you pay close attention to the appearance of Craniac, you will see that he actually resembles the Cenobite known as Butterball. Do watch out for Craniac and mark our words when we say that his character is bound to make you squirm at certain points. Tenebrog from The Unseen Directed by Tim Eldred and written by Shabon Byrne, The Unseen is the 10th episode of the series. The plot revolves around the mystical orb of Moldova, something that had previously never been seen by the public and was now an exhibit at the Manhattan Museum of Natural History. 
What no one realized is that whenever someone looks into the mysterious orb, the enslaved demon Tenebrog appears and takes away their eyes. With a rare class 13 on the loose and the proton pistol lost, it is up to Kylie and Eduardo to stop this powerful demon without their gear. The Orb of Moldova was a holy talisman that was chiefly used by the ancient druids to sacrifice human eyes to the gods in exchange for their protection. Tenebrog, also known as Tenebraj, is a demonic entity rated as a powerful class 13, which is the highest class on the scale. This monster also happens to be the only class 13 entity in the entire animated series and the whole franchise. Tenebrog looked like a nasty the orange blob. All one had to do is just look into the orb and their eyes would be pulled from their very own sockets, becoming implanted into the flesh of the demon. Now imagine this big orange blob with eyeballs everywhere. Not to forget that nest of eyeballs right in the middle. The sight can be gut churning for many. Well, it is comforting to know that the orb was ultimately destroyed and all the stolen eyes were returned to their rightful owners. After all, Tenebrog was one of the strongest and most powerful demons the team ever faced in Extreme Ghostbusters. <laughs> Akira from Darkness at Noon, Part 1 and 2 Directed by Rafael Rosado and written by Billy Brown, Dan Angel, and Dean Steffen, Darkness at Noon is a two-part origin story that marks the first adventure of the new generation Ghostbusters. The episode clearly established the fact that the spinoff was not going to shy away from dark, disturbing content. Part 1 of Darkness at Noon revolves around Akira, a contagious entity that is released by a group of subway workers. The former Ghostbuster Egon Spengler, who is now a university professor teaching paranormal studies at a New York college, initially tries to handle the situation alone, since most of his fellow Ghostbusters have quit and are leading normal lives. When he fails, his last resort is to gather together the only four students in his class and form a new squad of Ghostbusters. Part 2 of the origin story shows how Akira is spreading her disease, taking control of Kylie first and then infecting Spengler too. But this does not stop Spengler from training the new recruits, building new equipment, and preparing them for combat. Akira, the first entity that the new Ghostbusters faced, was the demon spawn of Duaka. Her name, a derivative of the Mesopotamian term Akira Tima, which means destroyer of civilization. Akira's objective is to spread her disease and bring about the decay of cities in order to fulfill the 11th prophecy. To do this, she takes on a host that is willing and releases a plague, which causes her victims to grow sickening boils on their face, also known as ghost zits. These zits are Akira's children, who require a host to grow in for a day. About a thousand years ago, Akira was held captive in an underground structure with the help of charms and holy objects. Who knew that the place she was imprisoned would one day become New York? Cut to present, construction on the future site of the Crosstown subway inadvertently sets Akira free. With the ability to fly, shapeshift, possess, and even release fire from her mouth, Akira is dangerously powerful. The way she approached Egon's student Kylie in the form of her deceased great-grandmother shows how conniving she can actually be. She did so in order to possess Kylie and use her as the perfect host to bring on the apocalypse. Akira took various forms, but her actual appearance was that of a serpent-faced woman who had long, sliding worms instead of arms. The worms even had their own unpleasant faces and could easily disengage themselves from Akira's body and attack people on their own. We know what you must be thinking, and you're right. The character of Akira truly happens to be a whole new level of redefined horror. <laughs> Gumo from Eyes of a Dragon Gumo is an ancient Chinese bone-stealing demon who appears in the 28th episode titled Eyes of a Dragon. Directed by Sam Liu and written by Joseph Kurer, the episode centers on members of a street gang who begin to turn up with all their bones missing. The extreme Ghostbusters probe deeper into the disappearance of a Chinatown merchant and realize that he has been possessed by the bone-stealing demon Gumo. As we go back in history, we learn how Gumo had warped the power of the pair of jewels, which were known as the Eyes of the Dragon. His plan was to control the 15 flaming circles and in due course become invincible. However, the dragon's eyes were used against him and he was enslaved within a golden dragon statue, the eyes serving mainly as keys to keep him imprisoned. Time flew by and Gumo became merely a legend, a fable used to scare children. In the present day, it's shown that the very same golden dragon statue was now in the possession of a Chinese merchant and his daughter. In the midst of a scuffle caused by a street gang to whom the merchant owed money, Gumo was accidentally freed from his imprisonment when the merchant's daughter removed the eyes of the dragon from the statue. Gumo instantly took control of the merchant and started stealing bones of the people he encountered. 
If you were wondering what he did with the bones that he took, well, he molded those bones into horrific looking bone creatures who became his minions, helping him search for the two gems. Do not make the mistake of thinking that Gumo was not that powerful without the eyes of the dragon. He was highly dangerous with the ability to fly, possess, teleport, and most importantly, to effortlessly remove bones from the body of his victims. Remember the enormous bone dragon that he created? It's pretty hard to disregard those glowing green eyes of flame and the fact that he made it his mission to steal the bones of literally every person present at the Chinese New Year festival. Creepy, right? Well, Gumo is terrifying and you better watch out for him. <laughs> Mirror Demon from the Ghost Makers Directed by Vic Dal Chell and written by Mark Amato, the 22nd episode revolves around a ghost dwelling inside mirrors. He has plans of taking over the world with his army called the Ghost Makers, who simply suck people's souls out and then possess their bodies. Eduardo happens to be the demon's first victim, and very soon all members but Kylie get sucked into the mirror. Now it's solely up to Kylie to save them and the rest of the world. The Ghost Makers are a horde of scary looking red demons that exist in an extra dimensional realm easily accessible by mirrors or any other reflective surface for that matter. They are led by their master, the Mirror Demon. It was his decision to take control of the human realm and therefore he sent his Ghost Makers to possess the humans. So when a human looks into a mirror that is already transformed, a ghost maker can very easily possess the human and literally eject their soul. Do not judge the mirror demon by his pale, skeletal appearance. He might look like a corpse, but he certainly likes to dress up. You will mostly find him donning a 19th century black suit. Speaking of his personality, he has this fetish for wreaking unthinkable pain on the possessed human spirits when they enter his domain. Remember the scene when the souls of Eduardo and Garrett entered his world? This is more than just a sadistic nature for the demon. Causing intense amounts of pain is more like a celebration to him. You do not want to mess with him. Tempest from Ghost Apocalyptic Future Hats off to the writer Steve Perry and director Tim Eldred for coming up with this science fiction treat. Ghost Apocalyptic Future is the 18th episode which centers on a time-related commotion. Somehow, Kylie ends up in a dystopian New York City, one that is ruled by a supernatural oppressor called Tempest. The ghost of Tempest is capable of living simultaneously in two separate time zones. Despite a gap of almost a century between them, it is up to Kylie to find a way to work with the extreme Ghostbusters, the ones who are fighting Tempest in the present times. But unless the group can find a way to fight together in the battle, Tempest just cannot be conquered. Tempest is a class 6 ghost on the loose, so it goes without saying that he is pretty powerful. Like a regular ghost, he has the gift of flying and can even go through walls. But let us not forget that Tempest also possesses elemental powers. This means he is capable of producing and throwing fireballs and can even beckon a gust of wind. His most impressive power, as mentioned before, is the fact that he is capable of existing side by side in two different dimensions. That's not all, he can even sense if something is wrong given the fact that he is in a parallel time stream. The character of Tempest became so popular with fans that he returned for a brief appearance in an episode called The Sphinx, where Egon is shown to display a picture of him. The character of Tempest also makes his presence felt in the end credit sequence of Extreme Ghostbusters. The Grundle from Grundlesque. If you ever thought that you were done with Grundle, well, we hate to break it to you that this notorious monster is back again, and believe us when we tell you that he is even more dangerous than he was the last time. The Grundle appears to be hunting children again in Martin Olsen's Grundlesque. The 24th episode, as directed by Vic Dal Chell, has Kylie in prime focus. The presence of his new Grundle activates a traumatic old memory for Kylie. You may not know this, but she was actually a target of the original Grundle some 10 years back. The case becomes even more dreadful and disturbing, especially for Kylie, when she is left with no other choice but to turn to the horrifying monster in order to catch a copycat who may have something to do with her past. Well, just like the character of Boogeyman, Grundle also seems to have a distinct bond with one of the extreme Ghostbusters. When she was a child, the Grundle tried several times to make Kylie come out, but she just wouldn't. So the monster decided to choose her friend, Jack, instead. One dark stormy night, she was playing at Jack's house when the Grundle paid them a visit. Although Kylie did hear the monster calling them out, she tried her best not to answer him, and to avoid him further, she went inside the house to look for her friend. But things were different for Jack, who chose to answer his call. Kylie found him just as he was opening the window, and probably the last sight she ever saw of Jack was his face turning into a grundle face. 
so you can imagine the horror that Kylie grew up with. Coming to the present story, Kylie was forced to confront her old enemy when Jack resurfaced as a Grundle. She learned that the original Grundle had kept Jack hidden in a cocoon all these years just to keep him from changing back to his real form. So after the Grundle escaped the containment unit, he went after Roland's younger brother Casey. But that was just to lure Kylie. The Grundle now simply had no interest in changing Kylie, he just wanted to see her in fear. We all know how exciting it is for Grundle to taunt children and make them commit dark deeds. He is also quite calculating in his plans, which he uses to affect the kids that he cannot influence. The sinister smooth talker happens to be the only villain from the original Ghostbuster series to return in an episode in its follow-up series. Also, you may not be aware of this, but his character was actually viewed later by many parents as a possible child molester. Well, when we have lines like and open the window, we will go away, far from all the adults, you know they can be easily misinterpreted. <laughs> Sphinx from The Sphinx Written by Steve Roberts and directed by Bob Fuentes III and Tim Eldred, The Sphinx is the 39th episode, and believe us when we tell you that it is undeniably one of the best. In it, we see the Sphinx, who is literally preying on all the intellectuals of New York City. It usually turns them into mindless idiots, draining their intelligence away when they are unable to answer its riddle. Well, like always, it is up to the extreme Ghostbusters to stop the creature before it gears up to attack a meeting that includes the world's most prominent minds at the United Nations. The Sphinx is a hideous monster, one that is made up of several animals like the Basilisk, or even Griffin, for that matter. Historically in ancient Greece, the creature would ask its victims a riddle. Walks on four legs in the morning. Had the victim not been able to answer correctly, he was drained of theta waves and left like a vegetable. It's true that the Sphinx was held accountable for affecting more than half of the whole population of Thebes, leaving behind elements including plague and horror. Cut to present, the Sphinx is busy doing the same thing, systematically hunting down the brightest of minds and asking them the very same riddle. When its victims fail to answer the question, the creature removes its mask, shows its hideous face, and joins a long green tentacle from its face to the head of the victim. This is how it drains the theta waves from their brains. This class 6 entity also possessed incredible strength and could even fly. The Sphinx usually treated humans with disregard, considering them to be hopeless and arrogant, so whenever it comes across people who think high of themselves, it challenges them to answer the riddle. You just cannot forget the manner in which it speaks, repeating the phrase, oh, I'll bet you guys think you're pretty smart. Also, it would be wrong not to mention an important aspect of the creature's personality, the fact that it is very on edge, especially when it's expecting an answer. <laughs> vampire Clowns from Killjoys How does the idea of vampire clowns sound to you? Does it already give you nightmares? Damn right it will. It's a given that most of us are a little nervous about clowns in the first place. Now add a terrifying and deadly prefix and voila! you have Vampire Clowns. Written by Alex Van Dyne and directed by Tim Eldred, the ninth episode titled Killjoys revolves around vampiric lamprey-like creatures who are disguised as clowns and consume victims who dare to laugh in their presence. The squad also has to find a remedy for Eduardo, who has been turned into a clown by the evil entities as a payback for confining and trapping one of their very own. The Vampire Clowns are also known as the Evil Clowns and all had separate appearances. While the first looked like a regular clown, the second one looked more like a chicken. The third one bore a resemblance to a knockover toy. The fourth one was more like a giant, creepy looking clown wearing boxing gloves and a tutu. The last one was their master who was kind of a massive lamprey hiding in a ticket booth that was shaped like a clown. This character had numerous tentacles whose tips were covered in soft feather-like appendages, mainly used for tickling purposes. But what's even creepier is the fact that these vampire clowns had the ability to infect others with the aid of a special jack-in-the-box toy that could turn people into vampire clowns. So yes, these creatures are absolutely terrifying, and you just wouldn't want to encounter them at any cost. <laughs> the Ghost Bride from Till Death Do We Start Do mark our words when we tell you that Till Death Do We Start takes the elements of horror and turns them up to 11, even giving the genre an all-new definition. 
Written by Lana Reichert and directed by Tim Eldred, the 29th episode revolves around a city yuppie who is literally tormented by an undead bride after he tosses a coin and wishes for a wife at a wishing well. The fact that the wishing well was actually the home of a wishgiver ghost makes the plot all the more interesting. The undead wife, also known as the ghost bride, happens to be a class 5 entity. She looks more like a skinless, vengeful bride, one that can fly and shriek. Yes, you heard that right. Possessing superior strength, she is quite capable of hiding in mirrors and other reflective objects. Also, let's not forget her ability to drain the life force out of her victim. She can also multiply herself thanks to her creator, the wish giver. So don't be surprised that when she was initially trapped inside the containment unit, the wish giver had already created her duplicate. In fact, the only way to stop the ghost bride for good is by defeating the wish giver. <laughs> Leprechaun from The Luck of the Irish Directed by Frank Squillis and written by Brooks Watchell, the 21st episode revolves around an accidentally released leprechaun that is set out on a vendetta against the descendants of those who trapped him in the first place and also stole his gold. To complicate things further, the evil leprechaun has also cursed Garrett with bad luck. Unlike most other leprechauns who are benevolent class 2 entities, this particular one happens to be a malevolent one. He may only be two feet tall, but his small stature does not stop him from lifting up Garrett in his wheelchair and tossing him with no effort, and he can even execute a flawless flip over someone like Eduardo. The leprechaun owns a shalala that fires green lightning bolts. These magical beams are largely used to capture his victims, or should we say, suck them into his pot of gold that he usually carries with him. He possesses the ability to teleport every time a person looking at him looks away or even blinks and he is capable of cursing others with eternal bad luck. Let's not dismiss his sadistic nature. He really does enjoy punishing his victims. The fact that he claims to be reasonable makes him seem all the more creepy and unhinged. Do watch out for this mischievous one. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.